college before. I'm glad we finally got an event that you guys are interested in. Uh, <laughs> most of our, our um, events are, we try to keep them non-financial, uh, non-market related, interesting uh, topics that we know nothing about that we hope, uh, we do know a little bit about this topic though. Uh, but uh, to, to us, uh, interesting topics that, that add some value. So um, Rick is uh, actually brother of one of our associates, Mary Beth Fitzgerald, and uh, we're thrilled to have him come in. He, he, he delivered these speeches across Ohio in many different forms. And, um, your bio is good looking guy from Copley. Is that mm -hmm. okay. Exactly. <laughs> Very good. Ho hope you enjoy. Hi, again, my name is Rick Arman. I'm a staff writer at the Akron Beacon Journal, and I have been there since 2005, and I've been fortunate enough to uh, be covering the, the beer industry here in Ohio and the beer industry in general. And I've also had the opportunity to write two books on beer. One of them was called Ohio Breweries. It came out at the end of 2011. And my latest one, which you probably saw as you came in, is the 50 Must Try Craft Beers of Ohio. Now, I like to give talks that are kind of interactive. So if you have questions as, as I'm going along, feel free to ask them. And how many people really like craft beer or into the craft beer scene? OK, that's good. Now, one of the things I wanted to do is answer a question that I get a asked all the time. How did I get into to writing about beer? And I learned early on that was the first question people had whenever I finished a speech, so I might as well start off the speech with it. And it's a really funny story. I was the public affairs editor at the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle in Rochester, New York. I was doing really important things. I was overseeing our State House Bureau, overseeing our Washington uh, DC Bureau. I was overseeing all the local government reporting. At the time, Hillary Clinton was running for Senate in New York State. I was overseeing like the coverage of that campaign, setting up events, uh, you know, debates for candidates. And one day our features editor came over to my desk and said, Rick, uh, we're going to start a beer column here at the paper, and we want you to write it. I said, oh, okay. What, why do you want me to write the, the beer column? She said, we hear you drink a lot. <laughs> and that is the honest story of how I ended up as a beer writer. <laughs> now, I don't think I drink a lot. However, I was really fascinated by all the different kinds of brands of beer. So I always enjoyed trying different things. So that's how people knew that I enjoyed beer. I would head out to a store in suburban Rochester called Beers of the World, and they allowed you to pick a single bottle of anything or can. And I would go in with friends, and we'd pick out 12 different beers, and that night we'd just split them and try them and see what we liked and what we didn't like. And really that's kind of how I got into beer, and I've fortunately been able to uh, continue writing about the industry. Unfortunately, though, it's not the only thing I write about. I also write about government and crime and other things. If somehow somebody would hire me just to write about beer, I'd be in heaven. <laughs> so as, as part of the talk, I wanted to kind of educate you on the beer industry in general and then also the Ohio beer industry. And I've learned a really fun way to do this is I'm going to give you a quiz. And I'm going to hand out the quiz, and I want you to take it with me. We're going to go over one question at a time. Feel free to shout out your answers. And I want to, know, I want to see how much you know about the beer industry. And I have given this quiz, I don't know, maybe 20 times or so. And I have volunteered to buy a, a beer to anybody who gets all the questions right. No one has ever gotten all the questions right. So I always try to throw in a few stumpers. But again, hopefully this is fun and you learn a little bit about the industry as, as you go along.
And there's pens there that you can kind of one each. One each. <laughs> And like I said, we're going to go over the, the questions one at a time, and I'll talk about them. And then we'll see, see how much you know, how many you get right. And you got to be honest with me. If somebody gets all the questions right, I'll buy you a free beer. Okay. I was at one event, got to the last question, and a woman there who said at the beginning of the talk she knew nothing about beer said she had gotten every single one right. So everyone else in the room said, all right, then you have to answer the last one first. No one else say a word. She got the last one wrong. I think she was fibbing about getting them right. <laughs> now, if you know a little bit about the industry right now, you know that beer is an economic juggernaut here in the US. The, the Beer Institute and the, uh, the National Beer Wholesalers Association, every two years, puts out a report sizing up the economic activity and impact of beer. So what do you think that economic ac activity was generated in 2016? Was it 35 million? This is across the nation. 35 million, 350 million, 35 billion, or 350 billion? 35 million. 35 billion. 35. 350 million. 350 billion. It's 350 billion. Wow. And one of, the, one of the things that you have to remember is it's not just the breweries. It's not just a, uh, you know, someone working at the brewery getting salary or the beer sales. This is also the distributors that deliver the, the beer. And I guess I should have said this is direct and indirect economic impact, where you're also talking about the bartender who's serving you the beer. So, Beer has a huge financial reach right now in the country. Just here in Ohio, that impact was 13 billion. We were talking about 350 million. 350 billion. No, no, not billion. Million. He said billion. 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 You said billion. Yeah. Billion. That's, That's the answer. Of dollars a person. The, an the answer is D. 350 billion? Billion. That's an overwhelming. That's a lot of money. Right. Hmm. Don't you how find that over Bush be right, Miss? Hmm. How how much? I mean, it's easy to see the 350 billion. Right. If you think of Anheuser Busch being a 200 billion dollar company. Right, and and that's one of the impacts. And again, you also have to think of all the imported beers. So, now, the craft beer industry is is growing like crazy right now. I think that's Why? Too. Well, I'll get to that in one second. And it's exploding around, around the entire country. And in 1985, there were 110 breweries across the whole nation. How many do you think there are today? More than 6,000. A couple of thousand. There's more than 6,000. See, yeah. The, at, the last, at the last count, there were 6,372. And there were an additional, I think it was 2,000 breweries in planning that are, were getting ready to open. So we're going to see this wave of breweries opening continue for a while, at least over the next couple years, correct? <laughs> now, the Ohio industry has exploded as well. And back in uh, the beginning of 2012, when my first travel book opened or came out, there were 49 breweries in the state. And that included an Anheuser-Busch brewery in Columbus, a Miller Coors brewery in suburban Dayton, and a Samuel Adams brewery in Cincinnati. Again. How many breweries do you think there are now? 25. More than 300. More. I checked yesterday, there were 277. Wow. So the answer was C. Oh, C. Now we're easily going to hit 300 because here in Ohio, there are 50 brewing permits pending before the state division of liquor control. And you asked, so why are we seeing this increase? I can talk. In, about Ohio specifically about why we're seeing the, the growth here. I really think there's three reasons. 
One, a couple of years ago, uh, you weren't, breweries weren't allowed to open a, or I should say breweries were not allowed to serve beer at their breweries without buying a second state license. So the license cost $3,900. To have your brewing permit, it cost another $3,900 if you wanted to serve it on premise, which the breweries thought was a little bit unfair. Right. And considering the fact that a, a license to make wine here in Ohio is $76 a year, they said, well, wineries get to serve their wine at their wineries. Why can't we serve beer at our breweries without buying the second license? So the, the state changed that, said, all right, you can open a tap room. And that really helped because these entrepreneurs, these brewers, could open smaller breweries. They didn't necessarily have to hook up with distributors. They didn't have to bottle. They didn't have to can. They didn't have to sell their beer to grocery stores. They didn't have to sell it to bars and restaurants. What they could do is they could flip on the open sign at their brewery, and people came in and drank beer and handed them cash and credit cards right on the spot. And that really helped for a small, helped small breweries. Now, one of the other reasons I already mentioned was that license that was $3,900, state, state lawmakers looked around and said, well, it is a little bit unfair if the winery license is, you know, 76 and the brewing license is 3900 so we'll lower that as well. And I got a question later about that, so I won't tell you what it was lowered to. But they lowered that as well, which allowed these small business people to open breweries. And then what I think is one of the greatest reasons is we live in a day and age right now where that eat local, drink local movement is very important. People want to know where their food is made where it comes from, where their beer is made, where their beverages are made. They want to know where their products are made. And you know what? If it's made around the corner, I enjoy that if I'm supporting somebody in my own community. Right. So that's made a big difference as well. So you asked why, why we've seen that increase. Those are really three of the main reasons I think we've seen them here. Now, the next question, number four, is I wanted to see if you could rank the breweries by size. Who's here in the US? Who's, who's the biggest, second biggest, third biggest, and? Budweiser's number one. All right, that's number one. Who's number two? Constellation. Miller Coors. No. Miller Coors is number two. Who's number three? Constellation. 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 Which Constellation, uh, Constellation owns a lot of Mexican brands, Corona, Modelo, and then Heineken. then Heineken would be number four. And obviously Heineken has Heineken beer. It also controls Amstel. It controls Foster's, uh, the Australian brand. Now, question number five, and this is a good one for this area, Great Lakes Brewing Company, which is in Ohio City here in Cleveland, <coughs> is the oldest craft brewery in Ohio. Started in 1988. And they really set the standard for craft beer here in Ohio. They're now, I'm sorry? They're a client. Oh, they are? Okay. <laughs> and so everyone always remembers the first. They're the, they're the first <coughs> craft brewery here in Ohio. Who's the second? Anybody ever remember the second to do something? No. <laughs> and this, this brewery opened a couple months after Great Lakes. But nobody ever talks about them, you know, their longevity. Wow. What's the Columbus? Mommy? Marietta? Columbus. Yeah. Never heard of it. For whatever reason, Columbus Brewing kind of stayed small and in central Ohio. Over the last year, last year and a half, two years, 
They bought a new production facility, and now they're producing beer statewide, so they have a bigger reputation and bigger footprint. What was the beer that they used to brew 25, 30 years ago in Columbus? I can't think of the name of it now. Hoster? Who? Hoster? No. A lot of the boys that went to school with me in, in the 50s, they used to have an open bar on Friday. All the beer you could drink free. Cutipole, Cincinnati. No, this was, that was Columbus. Okay. I, I keep on thinking of Mommy, but that wasn't. Mommy is uh, Toledo. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't. Burger, Burger Beer. Yes. Bur burger is uh, Cincinnati. Well, they, they had a, must have had a brewery in Columbus. I'm not aware of uh, them making burger in, in Columbus. Had a, a brewery in Columbus. Okay. Now, the next question, and some of you are drinking the uh, Great Lakes Dortmunder. Right. And that really has been the flagship beer for Great Lakes. Other than this little beer, I don't know, anybody heard of Christmas Ale? Yes. It's, yes. Uh, sometime, it comes out around the holidays. Yeah, we tried I, it. Right. Yes. We tried it. Um, Not as good as Dortmunder. <laughs> okay. And so, Dortmunder Gold, was not the original name of that beer. <clears throat> Do you know what the original name of that beer was? Nope. A good question. <laughs> it was Heisman. Really? Really? But, well, the Pat Conway and, and Dan Conway, who founded Great Lakes, wanted to uh, honor, um, I can't remember his first name now, Heisman, who grew up John Eisman in Cleveland. He was a pitcher for the Indians. And, well, they wanted to honor him, and they got a deceased and deceased and desist, cease and desist letter from the athletic club in New York City because they hand out the Heisman Trophy oh, right. annually to the, uh, the best college football player. And they said, you can't use Heisman anymore. So they stopped using it. And I believe it was Pat Conway's wife, they were talking about, well, what do we name it? What do we name it? And she said, well, that beer's gold. And so they named it Dortmunder Gold. And again, it has been one of their best sellers ever since they uh, released that beer. Everybody got all the questions right? Yeah. <laughs> now, when I mentioned before that breweries are opening like crazy here, here in Ohio and elsewhere, they really are. And one of the big trends has been breweries are not limited to big cities anymore. They're popping up everywhere. I go to places like Maria Stein. Anyone been to Maria Stein? Oh, yeah. I don't even think Maria Stein has a stop sign. You miss it. Um, it is in the, the western Ohio, the land of the cross-tip churches where there's giant Catholic churches that just rise up out of farm fields. And there's a brewery there. I went, I went to a town called Hicksville on the Indiana border. I thought it was a joke when I saw that. Who names their town Hicksville? But there's, but there's a brewery there, Two Bandits Brewing Company. Places like Lisbon, Ohio, you know, population 3,000. They've got Numbers Brewing Company there. So can you name the largest city in Ohio right now without its own brewery. I think the Cuyahoga Falls or Parma. Cuyahoga Falls has definitely has a brewery. Cuyahoga Falls has two and there's two more coming. It's, it's Parma. I mean 80,000 residents there in Parma. To me, it's just a matter of time before somebody decides to open up a brewery there. Because again, the trend today is toward neighborhood breweries, gathering spots, as opposed to like large production facilities. And you look around Cleveland, almost every suburb in Cleveland could support their own brewery. Again, just a neighborhood brewery, not one that's going to distribute <laughs> statewide and bottle and can. <laughs> so back in 2016, the state changed the alcohol limit allowed in beer. It used to be 12%. Years earlier, it was 8%. What, 
What What do you think the the limit is now? Fifteen percent. I would guess eight percent. No limit. There was six and there was three two. There's there's no limit right now. No limit. Again, the the state lawmakers looked around and said, "Well, wait a minute. There's no limit for wine. There's no limit for liquor. There's no limit for." anything else why is there a limit on beer and there were questions at first about and I went down to some of the hearings at the State House and people were some of the lawmakers were worried that well wait a minute are we gonna encourage kids yeah. to get drunk on these high alcohol beers and while it's a logical question you have to remember that Samuel Adams makes a beer that is 27 percent alcohol it's two hundred and fifty dollars a bottle. Is that triple box or uh, Utopius? Is that triple box preceded Utopius? And it, it is sold here in Ohio. It's not brewed here. No, it's not brewed here. But that. So you tell me whether, and I think this is something that swayed the lawmakers as well. If I'm a twenty-one-year-old kid. Am I going to go down to the corner store and buy a $250 bottle of beer? Or am I going to buy a 30 pack of natural light, you know, for $9.99 and get drunk? Right. So the higher alcohol beers are very, very expensive. They are not cheap. They aren't something that, um, you know, Why kids are. are so expensive? Because they're putting more ingredients in it. They're putting more hops in it. They're putting more malt in it to get that alcohol level up. And on top of that, they can they can charge a premium for it. And people really spend two hundred and fifty dollars for a bottle of beer. Mm -hmm. Did you ever try it? I have had it. It when the alcohol level gets to that point, it doesn't taste like a beer, like a traditional beer anymore. It tastes like a brandy. Mm -hmm. It's non-carbonated. Uh, it's it's a really interesting drink. Uh, they send me free bottles because they want me to write about it, <laughs> so I've tried it. Uh, again, it, it's interesting, but I would never spend that much on that beer. I know people who have gone in, and maybe four people have got together, and they've bought one, and they've all split it. So, right. Did you have a question? Kind of my question. I understand that the fermentation process self-destructs at a certain level of alcohol. The bacteria make it to kill off by their own juice. It, it's very difficult to make a beer with so that, that high of alcohol. You have to, are they adding alcohol? That's what all the other liquors are. I don't think they're adding alcohol. I think they're just adding enough sugar that gets that fermentation and that alcohol level that high. What kind of sugar? I'm sorry? What kind of sugar? Brown or white? Oh, well, <laughs> I guess the, the malt is the sugar. So the, the yeast is eating the malt. Now, I mentioned before that there's an Anheuser-Busch brewery in Ohio, there's a Miller Coors brewery in Ohio, there's a Samuel Adams brewery in Ohio. True or false, Ohio is the only state with all three of those breweries operating in it. I say, I say it's false. It's true. It's, it's true. Oh, really? there, there are plenty of states that have both a Miller Coors and a Anheuser-Busch brewery. But Samuel Adams has breweries in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and then Boston, and that's it. And they brew some on contract, but they own those three breweries. Is the brewery by Samuel Adams more recent in Ohio? It, they have been brewing in Cincinnati for a long time. I'm trying to remember when they bought, they bought the brewery from Hudipol Shaneling years ago. I know way too much about beer. <laughs> now, I had mentioned earlier that a license to make wine in Ohio costs $76 a year. What, what do you think a license costs for beer? It's $1,000. So it's still out of whack. But again, the, the, the brewers are happy that the, the fee went down from 3900 to a thousand. Ah. Yes. At one, uh, at one time, was Coors 
brewed in Colorado? Coors Banquet Beer is still brewed in Colorado. Yeah. And that they used to say that it was made from spring water in Colorado. Right. Now it's being brewed in Cincinnati? Uh, Coors Light is brewed in uh, Trenton, Ohio. So they had to get rid of the, uh, get away from that moniker that it's, it's Colorado Spring Water because. Well, <laughs> well, they they still brew that banquet beer, which is Coors, the regular beer with the yellow label, right. exclusively at the brewery in Colorado. Okay. So I think they still use that phrase for that beer. But all their other brands are brewed at facilities around the country. I mean, it's the same way with Samuel Adams. For a long time, Samuel Adams didn't want you to know they were brewing their beer in Rochester, New York on contract, or in Cincinnati, or in Pennsylvania. They wanted you to think everything's coming from Boston, because that's special. But they were brewing it elsewhere, because they couldn't produce as much as they needed in Boston. So. Now again, some of you said you're craft beer fans. Every year, RateBeer.com puts out the 100 top rated breweries in the world. At one point, a couple years ago, I, Ohio had five of them on that list. Again, top rated in the world, not just the US. And right now, Ohio has two of the top rated breweries in the world. Top rated in what, quality or quantity? Or? Qua <laughs> I guess I should say, yeah, in quantity, or I'm sorry, in quality. 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 These, are, these are considered the best, you know, breweries in the world. And again, there's two of them from Ohio, so can you name them? Great Lakes. Great Lakes, Great Lakes used to be on the list but fell off. Oh, wow. No. Prime No. Thirsty Bells. They were on the list but they fell off. Wow. Thir Fatheads was on the list but fell off. Medry. No. Platform. No. Columbus. Boy, they <laughs> All right, anybody want it? You want some hints? Yes. Yeah. Akron? Akron. Hoppin' Frog. Hoppin' Frog Brewery from Akron. Hoppin'. Hoppin' Frog. Hoppin' Frog. What, what Hoppin frog. Oh. They're, they're located in, in uh, Akron and they focus on high alcohol beers. Really bold, big flavor beers. $250 a bottle? Not that expensive, but they, they go for a, a price. I went in there and bought four beers, and my bill was $63. What name do they brew under? I mean, do they brew under any? Hop and frog. It's Hop and Frog. Oh, it is Hop and Frog. Right. So What's the, the other the, one? The, 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 it says Hop and Frog. Yes. But you don't find it in northeastern Ohio. You should be able to get it right. I have not been over there in a while, but you should be able to get it right across the street in Heinen's. Really? Mm-hmm. 22 ounce bottles. Right. How much? Yeah. Just 22 ounce bottles. They don't have 12 ounce bottles. Oh. They've, they have started selling 12 ounce bottles of some of their high, higher alcohol beers. Mm -hmm. And then the, the other brewery, anybody graduate from Ohio University? Jackie O's. Jackie O's. Jack, I'm sorry? Now I'm trying to remember what. Honestly, I don't remember what the number one is. It might be something like Treehouse out of Vermont. I honestly can't remember. Sorry about that. And these are all bottled. Bottle or cans. Right. Jackie O's, Jackie O's Brewery, and it, it was not it was not named it was not named after Jackie Onassis. It was named after the brewery founder's mother. Interesting. No. They're in Athens, Ohio, and you should be able to buy their beer anywhere around here as well in cans. Now, Ohio has been the home of some really unusual breweries. So I'm going to tell you four breweries. You figure out which is not the real brewery. Three of these are real. One of them is not. There's Pinup and Pints. It's the nation's first brewery inside a strip club. 
<laughs> There's Caroline Brewing Company. It's the nation's first nonprofit brewery that all they do is make beer like it was made in the 1850s. Then there is Biker Brew House. It's the nation's first brewery inside a Harley Davidson dealership. And there's the Floating Brewery, which is the fir nation's first brewery aboard a boat that tours Lake Erie, which isn't the real brewery. Oh, floating Harley Davidson. Eight. Floating. The floating brewery isn't the real one. The, the Pinup and Pints is real. It's located in Medway, just outside of Dayton. I did go visit there, which my wife said, of course you had to go. But I wanted to try it out, and all these brewers in Dayton told me, no, you got to go, you got to go. The beer is not half bad. And I thought... No, see, if you say it's not half bad, that means it is half bad. Right. And I went and I can tell you it was all bad. Whoa. I was not impressed. It's a very small system. So both half were bad. Yes, it, it, was, <laughs> it, it was not worth visiting or revisiting in my case. Caroline Brewing Company is located in Dayton. It is part of the Caroline Historical Park. They built a brewery just like it would have been built in the 1850s. They researched recipes from old wives' cookbooks in the 1850s and used those recipes, and that's what they make. The beer tastes very different than it would today. And for example, I'll just say it's different. Uh, you know, they dress in period costume there, sort of like Hale Farm and Village. They will, uh, you know, when they're smoking their malts, they're using a real flame there inside the brewery. So the beer will taste very different than, uh, you know, they naturally carbonate it. So it tastes very different than what you would get at a, a craft brewery today. Where is it? That is in Dayton. And then the Biker Brew House is located in Austin Town, over near Youngstown. And it's, again, just a very small operation inside a Harley-Davidson dealership. And the owner told me, you know, a lot of our riders like to drink. So we decided to, like, open a brewery and, you know, maybe they'll spend some more time here. Right. So. Which one was the most unusual? What's the point? Which one was the most unusual? In this group? Yeah. Oh. It was, and the floating brewery doesn't exist. That's the one I made up. Although I'm going to take credit because I'm sure somebody will come up with it <laughs> at some point. The Good Time 2 will suddenly become a brewery. Yeah. It's in the works, right? Right. <laughs> and then one of the, the cool things about this industry is craft brewers have repurposed a lot of old buildings here in the state. You look around, an old firehouse brewery is inside an old firehouse. Municipal Brew Works is inside a former municipal building. And there are, believe it or not, quite a few breweries in Ohio operating in old churches. So how many breweries do you think are operating in old churches, former churches here? Eight. Not enough? Is that <laughs> Very good. Good there are four of them oh, right four. now. <laughs> There's a fifth one that will be opening. I believe it's in Lakewood, but they're still a ways off at this point. So there's Taft's Ale House down in Cincinnati. There's Urban Artifact down in Cincinnati. There is Noble Creature in Youngstown. And then also Father, or, uh, Father John's in Bryan, Ohio, in Western Ohio there. Everybody got them all right, right? Yes. So the brewing industry, too, can be a lot of fun and maybe even a little bit irreverent. So there's a brewery in Worcester called JAFB Brewery. What do you think the JAFB stands for? Just a family. A. What did you say? Just a family. B. 
Just a family brewery. Just a family brewery. Just a family brewery. Just a family brewery. It's the answer is A. <laughs> and I'll tell you the story behind that, and this is something that I go into in the book as well. The the owner, no, 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 it's not dollar sign, it's a dirty word. <laughs> I just didn't put the real word down. Or is it? No imagination. Fancy. Um, so the brewer, his brother and friend were sitting around trying to go over, what are we going to name our brewery? And they had a couple beers. They came up with some ideas. No, 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 don't like this. They had a couple more beers. They didn't, didn't like the names again. Had a couple more beers. Wow. And then finally the friend said, it's just a blankety blank brewery. And they said, that's the name. Yeah. I got it. So they named it JFB Worcester Brewery. Paul Fryman, who's the, the founder and brewer, didn't think anyone would call it JFB. He thought that they would call it uh, Worcester, the Worcester Brewery. I can tell you no one calls it the Worcester Brewery. Everyone calls it JFB. And Paul is very shocked that parents come in all the time asking for kids' clothing with the JFB Worcester on it. And he kind of scratches his head and he's, he's not sure, do they know what it stands for? Or, uh, or do they think it stands for something different? But he, he tends not to tell people what it really stands for unless he thinks they could handle it. So, and then the, the last question, do I gotta buy a beer for anybody? Yes. <laughs> um, the last question is, one of the biggest trends in Ohio is wineries also starting to, to become breweries. And the very first one in Ohio was Cellar Rats Debonet Vineyards in Madison. Cellar Rats is now called Double Wing. Uh, they changed their name. Uh, but how many winery breweries do you think there are today? 21. I'd say 6 to 10. 6 to 10. There's 11 to 12. The last count I had was 12, and I know a couple more were opening. And it, they basically decided that when people were coming to the winery, maybe it's a wife and a husband, one of them liked wine, one of them didn't. And I can say that for my family, I used to take my wife on uh, you know, winery tours and be the designated driver because I don't drink wine, it gives me a headache for some reason and I only drank beer. So they decided that we could capture both these couples, th both these people, if we have both beer and wine. So that is what a lot of even smaller wineries are doing now. They're, they're operating very small uh, craft beer systems. Why did they change that name? I'm the Stu Honey for Cellar Rats. Cellar, I, <sighs> When I, when I wrote this book, I went out there and I was going to feature them yeah. because the book includes like the stories behind 10 of the coolest brewery names in Ohio. And I like Cellar Rats. Cellar Rats is the name of, you know, the worker who toils in the cellar. And I was there and talked to them and they said, we love the name. We're never going to change it. People want us to change the name. And then the next thing I know, they changed their name to Double Wing. Huh. And they said, well, uh, bars and restaurants don't want anything in their places with the word rat on it. Ratatouille, the movie, apparently didn't, you know, fix that, uh, you know, healthy image of a rat being in your business. So they decided to change it to Double Wing. Wow. Too bad. I, I enjoyed the name Cellar Rat. Me too. So... Now, I wanted to mention a little bit about my book too, and I forgot to like swipe through as I was uh, talking here. But basically what I did for this book is, back in 2014 and 15, 
I put together a list of kind of the 50 cool beers to have here in Ohio. And the book is intentionally not named the 50 best beers in Ohio because my 50 best is different from your 50 best, is different from her 50 best, different from yours. So what I tried to do is look at three different categories of beers. One, really award-winning brands. Beers like uh, Fathead's Headhunter. It's an IPA, one of the most outstanding IPAs in the country, <coughs> made over in Middleburg Heights, North Olmsted, or Canton now, depending on your location of Fathead's. And it has won medals at the Great American Beer Festival and World Beer Cup. You can't leave that beer out. Then there were beers that just had. Let me interrupt. You. Yes. You mentioned Fathead as one. Yes. Have you, uh, what's your uh, opinion of Fathead? Uh, of the, the beer, the brand? Yes. I mean, it's an outstanding uh, brewery. One of the most decorated, award-winning breweries know, in the U.S. What's your opinion of, of that? You know, drinking that beer. Of, of that specific beer, the Headhunter? Yes. Oh, I really enjoy it. Really? Mm -hmm. yeah. Why? It, it has a very intense, hoppy aroma and flavor. They have high alcohol content, too, if I remember. Uh, Higher than normal. Well, it depends on your definition of high. Uh, I think it's 6, 7, 8 percent. I, I believe that's like 7.4 maybe or somewhere around there. Yeah. So, I mean, your Budweiser is going to be maybe 5%. Five. Five so, but then again, I'm used to there's 7%, there's 12%, there's more, so. But I think that has, we, the reason I'm curious. He liked it. What? He liked it. I thought, yeah, well, we tried it. It comes in a small I bottle, if I remember correctly. Mm -mm. Well, that, that one, mm -hmm. I saw one in a small bottle. Oh, okay. When I say small bottle, I'm on a squat type bottle. No, not the, it doesn't come in the squats. Really? Columbus IPA. Right. I think that's Columbus IPA. Okay. I stand corrected. Okay. Oh, that's okay. And so, in, a, so many to from. In, in addition to like the award-winning beers, I also took a look at beers that kind of had really big followings in the state. Again, you've heard of this little beer called Great Lakes Christmas Ale. Hasn't won any awards, but boy do people like line up when that beer's released on the first day from Great Lakes. I've seen people walk out there with case, 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 you know, to their car just to get it because they only make it a couple of months for the year and then it's gone. Yeah. And so people want to buy it fresh. They have a tapping party that Santa Claus shows up for, you know, when they do it. It's a real special event when that beer is released. And then I also had beers that are really unusual. There's a beer that Elevator Brewing Company in Columbus makes called uh, Ghost Scorpion. Anyone ever had Ghost Scorpion? They made it specifically for the Fiery Foods Festival in Columbus a couple years ago. And it is made with ghost peppers and scorpion chilies, some of the hottest peppers in the world. <laughs> and what I do is I kind of share the story of how that beer was created. Dick Stevens, who's the owner, he was drinking some of the beer before it got served. And he was like, well, this, this is hot. And his face is getting all red, and he's pouring sweat. But he thought, if I can drink it, then all these people who are coming to the Fiery Foods Festival who love hot foods, love hot beverages, it's going to be too easy on them. So he pureed some more peppers and threw them in. And they brought a cask to the event, and they were serving it. A little while later, the organizers came over and said, you got to stop serving that beer. People were throwing up after oh. drinking it. <laughs> now, I had the... I had that first version, and I had about that much of it, and I felt it burn, 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 and then it was like that atomic bomb. <laughs> Boom. I immediately went and got some milk and started drinking it, and it was unbelievably hot. They did vow that they would never change the recipe, 
The second year, they did back off the heat a little bit. I mean, that first year, they had kind of bottled out of the casks. And I mean, there were pepper fla peppers floating in the beer. It was, it was unbelievably hot. So, but, but again, I throw through some of those beers in the book. So. Uh, I have family members that really enjoy hoof-hearted mm -hmm. beers where they can't go out and buy it. They have to drive to Columbus to pick up a limited supply um, and they have to like on Wednesdays at noon get tickets in order to go buy that beer. Wow. Just curious um, if, if you've had their beers and um, do you like them? I, I've had hoof-hearted, which again, they're, the name of that brewery, you know what it is? Say, say the name really fast. It's a real juvenile name. It's called Hoof Hearted. So if you say it, exactly, you say it really fast. So they, they operate, right, they operate a brewery out of Marengo in the middle of nowhere and they also have a place in Columbus, but they've built up this reputation of really making fresh beer, putting it in cans, selling it for a premium, and you gotta go there and get it, and they have a party at the same time. And their brewery in Marengo, I don't know if they go to Marengo or they go to Columbus location. They go to Columbus. The, the Marengo brewery is in the middle of cornfields. Isn't that on your way to Columbus though? Yes. Yeah, so they go to, yeah, they go to that. Okay. And again, they turn it into like an all-day party where you come down and you buy the beer and you sit around and you drink it. And the beer is very good. The only, th only criticism that I've heard of it is that they have the, it's the type of beer that you have to drink fresh. Yeah, that would, cause you, my family members are always looking at the date it was made and you have to drink it within one or two weeks of when it was brewed. Right, they, they want you to drink it right away because again, the way their beers are made, kind of the, the hop aroma, the hop flavor dissipates over time, so you wanna, get, you wanna drink it right away. Now, I mentioned that I had done, in addition to the 50 uh, must-try craft beers, I also wrote about 10 of the cool brewery names in Ohio, how they got their names. Uh, I profiled 10 people in the Ohio beer industry, craft beer industry, here are big players. And then I also, one of my favorite parts of this book that I learned a lot from was I paired up 10 Ohio made beers with 10 Ohio quintessential foods. Anyone know what Geta is? Geta. It, it, it's an oatmeal breakfast sausage that is is very popular in the Cincinnati area. I didn't know what Geta was before I started looking around for foods. Um, pierogies here in, in the Cleveland area. Uh, Schmidt's uh, Sausage, the Bahama Mama out of Columbus. Tony Paco's Hot Dogs. So I also took a look at like foods like that and paired it up uh, with a beer. So that that's kind of all I have. If you've got questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. So, so I'm seeing Stroh's popping up again. Where did it go? Uh, who brought it back? I'm trying to it's remember. It's not that great. No, I'm trying to remember who owns Stroh's, but basically uh, the Stroh's Brewery went under. However, they're, they're now owned by like a, a group that owns a ton of brands like Heilman's, Stroh's. It might be Pabst that's brewing Stroh's at this point. Out of Milwaukee? Right. Out of Milwaukee. A lot of fellows in my age group work for Carlin's. Okay. And what happened to them? They went out of business. I know that. Right. And that was one of the biggest ones here in the county. In the right. I mean, what happened was you had a lot of regional breweries back in, you know, after Prohibition, the 40s, the 50s, uh, you know, the 60s. And what happened at that time is Anheuser-Busch and Miller came in. came in and they started, you know, putting their car or putting their beer on refrigerated, you know, trains and trucks so they could transport their beer. 
They could also advertise their beer on television and radio. And so those brands rose right. while all the regional brands like Carling, uh, did Carling make POC? Yes. Okay. Um, the right. <laughs> Uh, all those uh, all those regional brands that were around fell out of favor, like Burkhart and Akron, uh, Hudipole, Shaneling down in Cincinnati. They all got overtaken. Buckeye in uh, in uh, Toledo. They all got overtaken by. A big one in Columbus. Well, I know Hoster was a big one in Columbus. No, it's actually a B. A B. B as in boy. A B. Columbus, big beer, right? okay. inexpensive beer. I I don't remember like the brands out of. Are are there like micro breweries in Europe, um, or is that just maybe a, a United States thing? I'm just curious if this is a uh, a trend that is taking place in other countries. It's now yes, for in Europe the neighborhood brewery has always been a thing where you can go to a town and instead of five bars in the town, it's five breweries. Um, and right now we are seeing a rise in microbreweries, you know, craft breweries opening in other countries. There's a uh, former uh, brewer from Columbus that just opened up a place in South Korea. It's a f so, I, I mean, these, these type of breweries are opening elsewhere because right now, for a long time, you know, Americans look to Europe, to Germany, to England for beer. And now, with the way Americans are brewing with the hops, they're looking to us for trends. Because we're at Carnegie, are there all these breweries, are there investment opportunities that you're reading about, seeing? Well, you know, I mean, it is interesting because there are investment firms that own breweries now. Okay. I can't, I'm trying to remember the name of, there's a brewery out of, of Utah, Uinta, that is owned by River, what's the Cleveland investment company, River something? <laughs> no, but, well, but there are private equity firms that are buying up breweries at this point because they see how the market's gone. I, I think at this point, a lot of people ask me whether we've hit that saturation point for breweries and the number that are opening. And I say yes and no. And it's weird to say yes and no, but if you're a brewery that distributes your beer, you sell at Heinen's, you sell at you know, bars and restaurants, that is getting incredibly competitive at this point. All much too, too much so, because people forget that, let's say I want to open up a brewery and sell my beer and cans to Heinen's. If I sell my can to Heinen's, somebody has got to leave the shelf. Yeah. They're just not going to add more space for me. If I want to have my beer sold at the Winking Lizard on a tap, somebody's beer has got to come off that tap. So at this point, we are saturated when it comes to distribution. However, we're not saturated when it comes to kind of neighborhood and community breweries. You know, exactly. Like the places that I was, I was saying, somebody's going to think I'm putting a brewery in Parma because I'm going to own Parma. It's going to be my backyard. I'm going to own that market, and I can make a go of it. And just like, you know, Numbers went into Lisbon and said, we're going to own Lisbon, and we're going to try to dominate Columbiana County. There aren't a lot of people in that county, but they're making it, you know, a go of it that way. And just like now you've got, uh, you know, breweries here that are own, trying to own their corner of Cleveland. So I think there's still a lot of room for growth for those type of breweries. The, the community meeting places, the like small, uh, you know, neighborhood places. Bottleneck is coming to Pinecrest in Beachwood. They will have 250 beers on tap. Oh, right. I just saw that. Um, and again, Pinecrest, yeah. I, I kind of. Uh, Pinecrest, the new development. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. I, I kind of wonder moving forward, too. I mean, there are some 
some places like that, and you know, the Winking Lizard and others that I think are being a little bit hurt by the, the craft breweries opening. And there's, there's nothing wrong with Yard House and, and all those other operations. But myself as a craft beer drinker, I, I tend to go right to the source. And a lot of people like me, instead of going to you know, the, the bar restaurant, will go directly to the brewery. What dog beer you recommend? I, I like Edmund Fitzgerald, but uh, anything else you recommend? Um, have you had like Hoppin Frog, Boris the Crusher? <laughs> that, I, I mean, that's outstanding. It's, it's, it's really uh, rich. Uh, Jackie O's Oil of Aphrodite. Pour, pours like motor oil. I mean, again, if you, if that's, when you say you like dark, that's really dark. Um, would you open a brewery? Would I open a brewery? I, I mean, I would love to. Would you? I, I brewed for a long time. But I'm also uh, self-aware that I am not the best home brewer. And if I were to ever open a brewery, I would have someone who's an outstanding brewer, uh, you know, go into it with me. Because again, I think sometimes nowadays, pla places are opening where their family and friends are saying, wow, you're a great brewer, you're a great brewer, you should open a brewery. And I could taste their beer and say, you shouldn't open a brewery. <laughs> I, maybe it's because the family and friends just are trying to be supportive and not telling the truth, or maybe they don't know the, the difference between like really good beer and I think that's part of average beer. How about the so. granite restaurant that they brew the beer there? Uh, oh, uh, Granite. Granite City over yeah. at Lyndhurst? Yeah. Legacy, Legacy. Legacy Village, okay. Yeah, I've, I've been to the, the Granite City in, uh, in uh, Toledo area in Sylvania, but I have not been to this one. But they have a kind of weird operation where they actually brew the wort off-premise in Iowa, and they truck it in and then ferment it on-premise. Put it in the big. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you had Pliny the Younger? Yes. Is it as good as everyone talks about, or maybe not? Yes. Okay. Unfortunately, it's called Pliny the Elder. It's a IPA, and it has been rated. I'm trying to remember how many years the now. The cousin, no, Pliny the Younger. <laughs> oh, Pl even more of a limited version. No, you know what? Maybe I ha no. I'm sorry. I haven't had that one. I do. I love Pliny the Younger. The El right. It's delicious, but they make the younger cousin version. It's only like available for like maybe a week, and, and you it, have to get it at. Right and you have to get it in California, so it's very exclusive. I just, just right. someone like you, kind of swear, I thought maybe you, you would have had it. What what makes it so outstanding? What's the, the key uh, element? I think they have limited supply. Just limiting oh, so the supply of it <laughs> creates such a big demand. A demand for it, right? And and it is. I mean, to me. I mean, I guess you say, how do you know it's good? I mean, how do you know something's bad? If you don't like it. Well, exactly. So, right. Well, I'll make an example. I tried this, this one today. Right. Is this local or?